Yeah. Okay, any questions from the last time? I incidentally, I, I did not realize that you already had a meeting with Arnab last week. Mm. Uh, I was under the impression that this Friday you're going to meet him for the first time. So, okay, you already met him. Uh, and uh, So I think what you can do is to submit the uh, homework up to, I don't know, till, till, uh, how, how many chapters you can do. Um, so we have, okay, first chapter is nothing. Second chapter. <coughs> Second chapter, there are um, how many? Excel, two three, three, three. Yeah, two, three, three chapters. Up to five. Two, three. <laughs> Maybe, well, five is what? Five? Yeah, five is the. Five, so two. Okay, I mean, I think maybe up, uh, certainly up to f chapter four. Two, three, four for sure. Right? Because there are very few problems. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, fifth, I don't know. Fifth, fifth, maybe there are more problems. There is eleven problems. Eleven problems, eh? Yeah. So maybe you can do fifth and uh, sixth for the next week. Eh? Okay. Okay. So f uh, up to four, you submit the. Uh, you can put it in this mailbox. You know where the mailbox is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Arnab Rudra, you can find his uh, mailbox and just put it there. Okay. And then Friday he will. Uh, I mean, I, I think what he will try to do is to encourage you to go to the blackboard and solve the problem, okay? okay? So please volunteer. Uh, okay. uh, uh, I mean, it's very important to, because that will also give you self-confidence. You know, you, you go on the blackboard and solve. It's a different thing. I mean, you get much more self-confidence. So, so you, I mean, use this opportunity too. Uh, I also should say the grades. So there will be, of course, a final exam, right? But uh, about 25 to 30% of the grades will be coming from the homeworks, okay. you know, your performance in the, during the you know, tutorials, okay. like, uh, for example, going and solving the problem, taking initiative to, you know, solve that. So that's about 25-30% of the grades will be from the homeworks, so. and then the rest will be final exam. Okay. So now we, we start. If, if there are no questions, then I can continue with the, what we start. What we started doing last towards the end, yesterday. Okay. So what we want to do is to construct representations. To construct SU two representations. All uh, let's say the finite dimension. Finite dimension. That's what we want to do. And uh, so to this end, what we did was, so we had the generator sigma A, uh, so sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 for the SU2. Uh, these are Hermitian generators, so it's more convenient uh, because, as I mentioned, Hermitian generators, Hermitian operators will have real eigenvalues, so, uh, so it's better. Of course, if you had an I there, then it will be anti-Hermitian. Eigenvalues will be pure imaginary, but it's, it's better to we are more used to real numbers. So, okay. so we do that. And then let's, so idea is what? The first thing, they don't commute. They don't commute with each other, right? Uh, so uh, you want to find eigenvalues. So obviously you cannot find simultaneous eigenvalues of all the three, right? Because, I mean, you see, if I have two matrices, M1 and M2, uh, and the commutator of this is not zero, then you cannot simultaneously find eigenvalues over both the guys, right? That, that is the statement. I mean, so this uh, this you already know from the linear algebra, I suppose, right? So what we want to do is to find, uh, so this, of course, uh, I'm doing for SU2. It's very simple, but I'm presenting it in a way which will also extend to anything else. I mean, also higher algebras like SU3 and so on and so forth. So the first step is to find a maximally commuting set of generators. Okay. So the first step is to find a maximal, maximally, uh, maximal set, let's say, of commuting generators. 
commuting. Now, in SU2 case, it becomes very simple. I mean, I can pick any one of them, take sigma 3. But once I have picked up sigma 3, I cannot put anything else in that set, right? Because neither sigma 1 commutes with sigma 3, nor sigma 2 commutes with sigma 3, right? So here, in this case, this maximal set just consists of one generator, which means it's a one-dimensional space, one-dimensional subspace of the Lie algebra, okay? So this, this is, so, uh, I mean, I could have chosen any one of them, but let's just choose sigma 3. Because sigma 3 already is diagonal, right? So you just choose any one of them. And uh, so the maximal set of commuting uh, elements will be any number times sigma 3, right? Because it's all vector space. So if I give you, this is a basis. Right? This basis is about, there's only one basis here, one element in the basis here. So it will be, it will span a one dimensional vector space. Right? So this is a one dimensional vector space. It's a it's a contained of course in the full uh, full Lie algebra, right? Yeah. As a recording, yeah, I, it, it's flashing. It's so I think it yeah. is okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first step. Then the second step is now look at the remaining generators and see if you can combine them in such a way that they are like. Uh, um, they're like uh, eigenfunctions. I mean, like. I mean, I will explain in what. Uh, so, so if you look at this particular combination, which I we were calling sigma plus and minus, which is equal to sigma one plus minus i sigma two. And in fact, let me also uh, use the normalization that we were using yesterday. So I will call this generator H equal to sigma three divided by two. Okay. Sigma three divided by two is also, I mean, any x, any number times sigma three is in this vector, in this one-dimensional space. So in particular, choose x, x equal to half. It is just for convenience. Nothing particular about that. All right. So again, I put a half here. Okay. This combination. Now, why is it, uh, uh, why is it uh, it's nice to do something like that? It's because the commutation of sigma 3, commutator of sigma 3 with sigma plus minus is uh, plus minus sigma plus minus, right? This is what we did yesterday. So it's, uh, it's plus minus one. Right? I mean, if, if, I didn't have uh, if I didn't have half here, if I had just sigma 3, then we saw yesterday there would be plus minus 2. But I mean, you could also work with that, but this is just more convenient. Now, why is it in, in nice? Because, you see, a joint, I mean, what is a commutator? A commutator is simply a joint, right? The joint action. Right? So, what we are saying is that add sigma 3 acting on uh, add of h, sorry. No, this is h, what am I saying? h and this sigma plus minus. So, h is exactly half sigma 3. If I didn't have, if I had sigma 3, I would put, it would be 2. No? So, that was the reason for that. So, add of h acting on sigma plus or minus is plus minus sigma plus minus. So you see this is, these are like eigenstates of the adjoint action. Eigenstate, eigenstates with the eigenvalue plus and minus. So this is what you will do also in other groups, other Lie algebras. We will do the same thing, right? We will first find the, the, the maximal set of commuting generators and this subspace is called Cartan sub algebra. This is a sub algebra of the original algebra. Okay. So this this is by definition of Cartan sub algebra. Uh, what was the connection between adjoint uh, operation to the commutator? Yeah, yeah, I think we, we uh, Yeah, let me see. Didn't we discuss that? I think we discuss. Just conjugation. Not charge conjugation. The adjoint, we conjugate uh, the adjoint. Uh, what the, the, the action of the adjoint is it, it, it conjugates them. Uh, it's a computer. Yeah. yeah, so exactly. So that was right. I mean, at the level of group, at the level of group, remember, add of G was uh, uh, simply uh, G inverse uh, times add G of acting on X. X is an element of D algebra. Uh, it was just that. So add G, 
uh, takes the Lie algebra, uh, what I was calling here, Lie algebra, to Lie algebra. Right? It's a map from the Lie algebra to Lie algebra. So it's a representation. You can represent it as, uh, as matrices. Whenever there's a linear action between vector, active and vector space, you can always write them as matrices. Okay, here we are not writing as a matrix, just symbolically we are writing. And G is that. But then, if I take G itself as 1 plus some, let's say, Y, where Y is a small infinitesimal generator, then plugging it that there here, you see that you can define how the add Y acts on X. That is simply, I don't know, plus or minus sign. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, x, y, or y, x, or something. Maybe, maybe the way I've defined it will be probably, OK, it doesn't matter. Yeah, Let's call this minus here. Yes. So y, x. Okay. So, that, that's the, so that's the, the way the, I mean, if you know the, how the group acts on some vector space, then of course, you just restrict to the infinitesimal element. It will give you an action of the Lie algebra on that vector space. So this is a particular, this is a, of course the most important, uh, not most important, but it's a, a, a joint representation is something that by studying that, you learn a lot about the Lie algebra itself. You know, because it, it uh, crucially includes the commutator. Right? The way it acts is through commutator. And commutator has all, information, all the information about the Lie algebra. You know? The Lie algebra is, a, okay, one is a dimension, for the Lie algebra, but that, that, that just tells you what, what dimensionality the vector space it is. But the most important in non-trivial information is in the commutators. Right? And that commutator, that information is captured by this, uh, by captured directly by this uh, joint representation. Okay. So, so what this, uh, so the, uh, comparing with that, you see that this nothing else but the add H, add H, a joint H action on sigma plus and minus. So it's just that. So th therefore, the sigma plus minus are eigen eigen states, no, and a joint action of this kappa. So as I said, I'm just trying to keep it in general. Uh, so uh, the, so the first step is this: you find the maximal set. This is called Cartan sub algebra. In the SU2 case, it just happened to be one dimensional. You go to higher algebras, it will not be. It will be higher dimensional. Okay. For example, in SU3, you will find there are two. It's two dimensional. Yeah. Then you look at all the remaining ones. In the SU2 case, the remaining ones are only two, sigma 1 and sigma 2, which I can write in this combination, because in this combination, they are eigenstates of their joint action. Uh, okay, so so that is what we will do also for SU3 or everything else. All the other algebras will exactly do the same thing. Hmm? Okay. Now, these eigenvalues, uh, these eigenvalues are called root vectors. Okay, for the reason why we, that it will become clear when we go to SU3. Okay. At this point, it is a number. I mean, you know, that it was a, it's a number just because we have only one, is one dimension of this. So we have only one generator in the Cartan sub algebra. But suppose that you had a situation where there's more than one independent generators. So let's say two dimensional. Suppose the Cartan was two dimensional. So I'll have H1 and some H2, let's say, which are generating this uh, uh, Cartan sub algebra. Okay, the basis for the Cartan sub algebra. Then I can, since they commute with each other, I can simultaneously diagonalize them. I can simultaneously find eigenstates no, for both. Okay, And then in that case, what you will have? You will have H1 and H2. H1 will have some eigenvalue. H2 will have some eigenvalue for the same object, for the same. So there will be two eigenvalues. right? And these two eigenvalues, you can write it as a vector, two-dimensional vector. Okay. So this root vector, will, these root vectors will have the same dimensionality as the dimension of the Cartan sub algebra. But SU2, it just happens as one dimensional, so it is a number. In this sub algebra, it also presents the, the bracket, the bracket? Yeah, this sub algebra is commuting. So it's, it's all zero. Okay, yeah. Right? I mean, that's a maximum set of commuting. So if you take any two elements, H1 and H2, okay, uh, inside zero. this, I don't know what shall I call it. Okay, inside this kappa, 
inside this Karta algebra. Yeah. Then by definition of the Karta itself, H1, H2 is 0. Okay. The maximum. So it's a very trivial, trivial algebra. Karta yeah. subalgebra is always a billion. And the generators of the Cartan subalgebra should always be for the, gener the, the generator. We don't add the Casimir operators. Of no, no, no. Only for the generators. So it's a subalgebra of the original Lie algebra. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a subspace. So a subspace, a and, and therefore also a subalgebra, because it's in a trivial sense, because anyway they come to the definition. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they commute, so therefore, I mean, zero is always an element of the vector space here, right? Uh, x equal to zero, so zero is always, so it's, it's, it's closed under commutation relation. Okay, uh, so that uh, was the first step. Uh, and now we, we got this here, and okay, using this now, we will be able to construct uh, arbitrary representations. So idea is the following. Uh, so far I didn't talk about, I mean, we only talked about a joint representation. But now take a generic representation. Okay. So it's such a map between, from the Lie algebra to set of some n by n matrices. Okay. Some dimension. Some so we'll, so let's say, uh, so, so there is some representation. So in some representation, and I will always uh, uh, work with the irreducible representations. Why? Because as we saw, saw yesterday, that uh, any reducible representation can be always decomposed in terms of irreducible representations, right? And uh, once you know how the Lie algebra acts on the ir each irreducible component, then you know how it acts on the whole thing. Okay. So it's just enough to study irreducible representations. Irreducible. In some irreducible representation. And um, I think, okay, I'll just follow that notation there. So what I will do is, so, so each of these elements is mapped to some matrix, right? Each of, those, each of those generators. So let's say H is mapped to some matrix, and I will just use this, instead of writing it as RH, okay? This is what I was doing all the time. To, to save the, I mean, writing, okay? I will just use this capital H. But this understood, this is some, this is some n by n matrix. These are all n by n matrices here. And then you have sigma plus and minus, uh, which I think we already were calling these guys as E plus and E minus, right? Mm -hmm. I think I was calling E plus and E minus yesterday. So E plus and E minus will be mapped to again some matrices. E plus, I will call it capital E plus and E minus. Okay? This is a short form for what I was calling before R E plus minus. Right? And this is a short form for R H. Okay. Now, of course, a representation means that the Lie algebra must be preserved, right? The commutation relation must be preserved. So, which means that uh, the same commutation relation. So, for example, if H with H will be zero, and H with E plus minus will be plus minus E plus minus. And finally, of course, there was one more commutation relation, which we also discussed yesterday. It was sigma plus with sigma minus was, I think, 2h, right? 2h. Yeah. So this will also be preserved here. So e plus e minus will be 2h. Okay. So this is the starting point. Okay. Now, the next step is the following. Now, uh, see, uh, H, I mean, let, let's suppose, okay, I have some, uh, it's uh, this n-dimensional uh, space, okay? In that, I look for some eigenstate of H. Okay? H can be, I mean, I can find eigenstates of H. So, let's suppose there is some state V, which has eigenvalue that H acting on V. So, this is a notation, this is just a n column vector, but it's a one particular element, right? This is a column vector. This is the n by n matrix, so this will be some n column vector. Okay. And I'm just this notation is just saying that it's one particular eigenstate. Okay. One particular eigenstate of that. Which is uh, which uh, let me see what I was using. I was using what notation? I will try to use the same notation 
is J, you know, M, M, M. Yeah. okay. So M, V. M is some, M is some real number. A real number because we are got talking about Hermitian. So M is some number. Uh, okay, that's one. Now, so I know uh, how H acts from this, this particular state V. Okay? Now you can ask the question, what happens when I apply the remaining generators? The remaining generators are exactly E plus and E minus. Right? So the question is now, what, uh, when I apply now E plus or E minus on the state V, okay, uh, can I say something about the state? For example, one can ask the question, is this state again an eigenfunction of H? Eigenstate of H. Huh? That's the one question you can ask. So the question is, is, is this state, there are two states, plus and minus, the, yeah, are these states uh, an eigenstate of H? That's the question. So to do that, we just uh, to check it, I just apply H and see what, what do you get. Right? I think I just need this, I can erase this part, I just need this part now, this commutation relations. So, so I have, let, let us apply H on E plus minus on E. Well, we don't know much, right? The only thing we know about this H and E plus minus are these commutation relations. So we have to somehow use it. Hmm? So the idea is to use this, and this trick we'll continuously be using, I mean, and everywhere, this, uh, this trick. So you can derive this as uh, the commutator H E plus, uh, let me just do it in two steps. So I can rewrite this as this minus e plus minus h plus e plus minus h. Right? I've changed nothing. I just added and subtracted the same piece, so nothing happened. Right? But this guy is a commutator. H e plus minus commutator. And this we know from that is plus minus e plus minus. So you get here the first term is plus minus e plus minus. And the second term, I mean the last term is e plus minus times h acting on v, but that's already an eigenstate of h, so and that with eigenvalue m, so you get this here, which I can write as m plus minus 1 times e plus minus So you see this state is also an eigenstate, I mean that's what we are asking, right? Is this state an eigenstate? So what we say, see is that H acting on this state, that's what we have been calculating, is equal to the same state, this state, times a number. Okay? So that number will be the eigenvalue of this state. Eigenvalue with respect to H right, of this state. So we see that uh, uh, basically what this E plus and E minus is doing is raising or lowering the eigenvalue of h in one unit. This one unit because the way we have normalized it. If we had used sigma 3, then it would be two units. That's the reason why I normalized by two, so that by half, so that you have a unit steps. Okay. So now we can start doing this. We can start keep, keep applying, keep applying these states. Okay. There's this e plus and e minus. So I started with the v, and uh, let's let's just apply a e plus for the moment. So e plus v, then I can apply to make it e plus square v. I mean the square makes perfect sense because now I have just matrices. Okay. Let's take the square of the matrix. Uh, and so on, keep going. So this has eigenvalues. So here I'm writing the states, and here I'm writing the eigenvalues of h for these states. So this is m, this is m plus 1, m plus 2, and so on. Now all these states have different eigenvalues. So they cannot be linearly dependent. Right? They must be linearly independent. Okay. So each one of them is adding to the dimensional, I mean, you know, counting one dimension. Right? But we said that we are talking about finite dimensional representation. Right? 
So at some point, this process has to stop. Otherwise, it will go all the way to infinity, right? So it will become infinite dimensional. So at some stage, it must stop. Now, how can it stop? Hmm? The only way it can stop is, let's say there is some, uh, some e plus to the, say, l, v. This exists, let's say, so this is m plus l. But the next one somehow should not exist. So how, can is, how is that possible? The only way it is possible is if the next one actually happens to be zero. You see. You see I mean, already in this analysis, uh, I mean, all we are saying is that h acting on e plus minus v is that, right? But it could have been that this itself is zero. Then nothing. Uh, you don't learn anything from that, right? This might be zero, right? So, so what we are saying is that uh, the, the finiteness finiteness of the dimension of the representation, finiteness of the uh, dimension of representation implies that this must stop uh, and that there must exist some L such that that E plus to the L V exists, meaning it is not zero but e plus to the l plus 1 acting on the, on the v is 0. So this is a necessary consequence of uh, finiteness. I mean finite dimensionality. Okay. So, uh, so in other words, uh, this I can write in a slightly different way. I mean, it's the same thing, of course. This I can write it as e plus acting on this thing, right? Is we are saying this is equal to zero. So that what what you're saying is there must be some state in your full representation in this n-dimensional space which is annihilated by e plus. There must be some state which, which should be annihilated by. That state is called the highest weight state. Okay. Yeah, I, I, this is just terminology. It will become probably more clear when we discuss more general the algebra. But at the moment, let's just say as a word. Highest weight state. Uh, in this case, I mean, highest weight is simply that it's the highest possible eigenvalue, m plus l. This is not, I've not proven that yet, but uh, we will shortly see that indeed this is the highest uh, uh, h eigen, uh, h capital H eigenvalue in this irreducible representation. We will see that. It's not, not been proven yet. Huh? Okay. Uh, so, so let me just call the state as I don't know, uh, give some name to it again. Let me use the same notation. Uh, yeah, so. So, okay, here, I mean, here we are not using the uh, this uh, cat notation, so, but doesn't matter. Uh, so, uh, so here, so let me just call this state as I don't know something. Let's call it uh, W. So this state is a W. I call this E plus to the L. This state, I'm just calling it W, is some state. And so, so the conclusion is there must exist a state W, which I call W, such that E plus acting on W is zero. So this we said this is called highest state. Highest weight state. Uh, now, this W will have, uh, I mean, as we saw, the eigenvalue of H was M plus L. So, okay, it is some number. So, let me just call that number H acting on W is some number I call J. J because this is what will uh, come out, turn out to be J, spin J representation. Okay. So, that's why I'm anticipating this and just using the symbol J. J W. Okay. okay. Now, what we do? So let's now start from this W. Okay. So before we started from any any eigenstate V, and then we kept kept going up, and we arrived at something some state which is annihilated, and that I'm calling W. Okay. Now I go backwards. So now I start applying. I mean on the W I W I cannot apply E plus because E plus when you apply you just get zero, so nothing happens. So what H just gives you a number. So the only other non-trivial generator is E minus, right? So let's apply E minus on W. Well, I'm going to get something 
so, so I, again, I look at this chain, w, e minus w, e minus square w, and so on, keep going. But now, if, as we saw, e minus, uh, where was that? Yeah, it's e, e minus, uh, when you apply e minus, it lowers the eigenvalue by one unit, right? So if this eigenvalue, so now here are the eigenvalues. If this is j, then this is j minus 1, j minus 2, and so on. Again, just for finiteness, it should stop somewhere, right? So let's call this uh, uh, to, to be e minus to the, I already used L. I don't know, what should I call it? K, let's say K. Huh? E minus to the K uh, on W exists. But after that, the next one does not exist. But yeah, this I, maybe, maybe I should just write it down here. H uh, E plus minus. Plus minus. Plus minus. I mean, this is the most important thing. OK, let me also write that. Equal to, to h. But then the next one, so that, so again, the same argument like before. So this will have eigenvalue j minus k. Right? But then the next one is annihilated. So e minus to the k plus, uh, k plus 1 acting on W is equal to 0. Okay. So there must exist, for the same reason as before. So the finiteness implies there must exist some, some K such that, such that this is not 0. I mean, this state is not 0, it's a non-zero non state. But this state is 0. Okay. Right. Now, so OK, this is fine. But now what we want to do is to find I mean, the question is, can we find a relation between k and j? Right? So another way to say that if somebody tells you that this is the highest wave state has h quantum number j, then, then can you just, without doing this explicit calculation, hmm, can you directly say what should be the k? Okay, that, that's the question. Okay. So, for this, again, the only, only tool we have is the Lie algebra. So we have to just use the Lie algebra to get this information. But before that, let's just try to look at this. So OK, I have now k plus 1 dimensional space, because these are all linearly independent. They all have different eigenvalues. So they're all linearly independent states, right? So now we have spanned a k plus 1 dimensional space, right? The, the question is, is it? I mean, so I, I know the action of E minus. E minus takes you from here to there, from here to there, from etc. etc. H also I know. H acts on each of them and gives a number. Right? So under the action of H and E minus, this space is certainly invariant. Right? Meaning a state from here goes to the a state from here, from the same space, right? Okay? But we don't know about E plus. Right? We don't know whether E plus acting on these states gives you back again some combinations of these states. We don't know that. Because if you could prove that, suppose you could prove that E plus uh, acting on this space, space generated by these vectors, gives you back again a vector in the same space, then you would say this is an irreducible representation. Right? But isn't that obvious because E plus and E minus just trace and lower, so if I Lower something and with again it goes back to the same. Uh, That's uh, the point. But up to up to um, uh, normalization or something. No, but what? How do I know it's not degenerate? I mean, there could be degeneracy, right? Yes. Maybe uh, at a given eigenvalue, say j minus two, there is not just this state. Maybe there are other states too. Yeah. Then e plus would have taken to any one of them, right? Right. So that that's what one wants to prove that e plus will take you back to exactly these states uh, up to some number, right? Not a new state. What was the connection between irreducibility and uh, our point here? Uh, no, we wanted to construct finite dimension irreducible representation, right? So uh, that's why I wanted to check if this is irreducible or not. If it's not irreducible, then I have to add more states here, right? Meaning if this is not closed. I mean, it's certainly irreducible because, uh, uh, I mean, E minus already is taking you to all of these places. So if the space cannot be smaller than that, right? 
But the question now is, is it a representation? Not so much irreducible. Is it a representation of the full Lie algebra? Right? It could be that, uh, you know, suppose that it happened, that when I apply uh, E plus, I will go back in terms of eigenvalue, one less, uh, you know, one more eigenvalue. But it could have been a linearly independent state. How do I know that it is the same state as that existed in this list? No. In fact, we will see, okay, the answer is, of course, it turns out in SU2, there's no uh, degeneracy. There's always one. You know, there's, uh, there's no, not a linearly independent state. But th this is only a special case for SU2. Once you go to SU3 and so on, this is not true. Hmm? So, but in any case, one needs to check it. No? So let's, uh, let's look at any one of these states. Uh, let's say uh, I take E minus uh, to uh, some uh, uh, R, let's say, right? which is between, uh, so R is some number between uh, 0 and K. Okay, so one of these states. And I ask the question, what happens? So this acting on B. What happens if I apply E plus on this? Right? So basically what we want to show is that this is going to be, we want to show, so this is a question, we want to show that this is proportional to, I mean some number, uh, times E minus to the R minus 1. Right? Some number times that. That's what we want to show. Right? Which means that that would, if, that would mean that this will just go to the previous state, up to a number. It won't give you a linearly independent vector. Right? That, that's what we want to check. Okay, so, so let's again do our favorite trick. Uh, our only thing we know is the algebra. So we just have to keep using the algebra. Okay? So and let's say I can take step by step, write this, uh, E minus, uh, keep E minus to the R minus 1. There. Okay? And then I can add, so this is the this times that minus other way around, but then I have to remove the other part, right? So that will be plus e minus e plus uh, times e minus to the r minus one. Now this is what this is two h, right? So two h times acting on e minus to the r minus one b. But this already I know, it is simply 2 times j uh, minus r minus 1, right? This, these are the eigenvalues. These are the eigenvalues of h. These are, these are all eigenstates sort of which, so. And those are the eigenvalues, that's the eigenvalue, j minus r minus 1, uh, times this guy. Okay, plus I have this state, uh, plus I have this guy. Now, let's keep doing, keep repeating this, keep pushing it step by step. Yeah? Each time when you do that, each time you do this, okay, so let's just do one more step, then you see a pattern. Uh, so again, I will write it as now E minus, commutator of E plus E minus, and then I have E minus to the R minus 2. So I took, took again one of them, and B. This guy is again 2H. But H is now not acting on the full thing. Like here it was acting on the this state. Now H is acting on this state. Okay. So this will have eigenvalue how much? It will have the eigenvalue J minus R minus 2. Okay. Here it was J minus R minus 1 because the, it was act, this H was acting on, on this state where you have applied R minus 1 lowering operators. Okay. But here H, H is appearing here, this, this position. These are not abelian algebras, right? So you have to be careful about the position of H. Now the H is acting here on, on this state, but this has R minus 2 lowering operators. So its eigenvalue will be J, J minus R minus 2. But then, uh, this is a, now this is a number, 2 times this is a number. I can take it out and you will again get E minus the R minus 1, which is the same as this. Okay. So now you can convince that, so, but then after doing that I still have another piece, right, which is the other piece which, which I subtracted to get it, to write this into a commutator form, but then that will be E plus one more step closer, you see. So the, what is the extra piece I need to put here, E minus, E minus square, E plus E minus to the R minus 2. I mean, so this was this is what I'm trying to write. I write this as a commutator plus, of course, the extra piece. 
the extra pieces here. Okay. But you see, in this process, what are we doing? We are step by step pushing E plus in. Right? But at each step, what I'm going to get is some number times the same state. Right? So here also you got the same because this, this will give me this action, this is 2H. This will give me 2 times J minus R minus 2 times this state E minus to the R minus 2 V. But I have still an E minus outside. Right? This is a number, can take it out. Then E minus times E minus to the R minus 2 is the same as E minus to the R minus 1. So at each step, you will just get, keep getting the same state up to some number. These numbers will change because this is going closer and closer, right? So this number will keep changing. Actually, it will keep uh, incre increasing by one, one unit, right? Here it was some number, this number. Now it has become one more and so on. Each, each time this number will keep increasing. Uh, and, and finally, after the R steps, uh, uh, you arrive at a situation where E plus directly acts there. Okay? But this is, this is the highest weight state. So E plus annihilates it. Okay? So altogether you see when I, when I apply E plus on, on this state, on this state, I'm going to get some number, some number times the same state. Yeah, e minus to the power of R minus 1. That number you can compute if you want to, but I mean it'll be some number. Right? Yeah. And, uh, this calculation proves that we end up with the same state, but it's uh, only for SU2, right? Because yeah. in the degenerate case, uh, we shouldn't end up with such a uh, conclusion. Exactly. Uh, so in a way, uh, that comes from the properties of the SU2 uh, real algebra. Right. So it's kind of a proof that we have uh, non-degenerate eigenspace space. Yes. Uh, by showing this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it is. Uh, of course. Uh, the, yeah. I mean, because I mean, I mean, here it's very simple. The Cartan is one one-dimensional, and uh, yeah. I mean, of course, algebra has been used. The the moment you go to higher algebras where Cartan is higher dimensional, eigen eigen values are also vectors now, right? Because you have there is a root, root factors I'm saying, and you'll see that uh, in this so let's say two-dimensional root space, you'll have various different ways of arriving at the same point. You know, here there was only one way to arrive at this point. Just keep applying e pluses, you no. Know? Uh, but there you you start having t different routes to arrive at the same point, and then then you can show that these different routes don't give you back the same state. Okay. That's that's the way it works out. Excuse me, but here you said at the end when we. Reveals this and E plus uh, operates on that case V, it will activate it. Uh, uh, sorry, repeat again. Did you say that when E plus, uh, when we reveal this process uh, as yeah. many times as we need until E plus operates directly on, on the case V? On the will it activate it? Yeah, because V, we start, is it? W, w. sorry, sorry, I'm, uh, I mix it up. Yeah. This is W, I'm sorry. Okay. This is W, yeah. yeah. This is the highest speed stock. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I started from here, no? and then I, I, I uh, yeah, uh, I'm looking at this this set of states. Yeah, okay, double. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, and also by defining uh, plus minus operators, we kind of uh, prove that uh, all eigenvalues are uh, at the distance one from yeah. each other. Yeah. And it should be because yeah. we didn't uh, calculate it in it, but the algebra shows that. Yes, uh, so it is the case always like it, but when m becomes an integer uh, and when we hit the zero point uh, in this chain, uh -huh. there is also another way to annihilate the chain. Not by uh, having a zero vector, which is annihilating the state, but by having a zero eigenvalue. Ah, ah okay, okay. Yeah, that, that is, uh, that is, yeah. It is not, the, the state is not zero. I mean, the state is not zero. So, for example, let's say, yeah, only h and i it, not e plus and e minus. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know the number. Uh, the no. number I mean, take take an example. Suppose suppose uh, j was uh, one. Then uh, the first first uh, time I apply e minus on this state on w, then I will get 
with j equal to zero, right? So this will have, I mean, this will have a quantum number j minus one, right? Which is zero. But that doesn't mean that e minus w is a zero state. It is a non-zero state. It is some particular state. Only, only what it tells you that h acting on that is zero. Right? So the state is not zero. Is, is was that the question? No, the, yeah, the, no, because in that case the chain might be broken. Yeah. Uh, no. no it, yeah. That, that yeah, yeah. Because the state is there. The state is. This is not zero. We are not saying that this is zero. The zero vector. No. It's a sub vector whose just happens that the, its uh, h eigenvalue is zero. So when h acts on this, it is zero. Yes. I mean, take uh, a joint representation itself, right? So what is the analog of this? Uh, so the analog of the, a joint representation is exactly sigma plus. The highest weight, what we are calling, so in that joint representation. A joint representation, the vector space is the same as the Lie algebra. Because a joint representation is acting on the Lie algebra, right? So it just so we can as well just use the notation of the Lie algebra itself, right? So what is the, the state? What we are calling W, the highest weight state, it is nothing else but sigma plus. Okay, because sigma plus uh, commutative with sigma plus is zero. Sigma plus is or some number times sigma plus is the highest uh, one half of sigma plus is what we are calling E, right? So I mean call E plus itself. E plus is the highest weight. E plus with E plus is zero, of course, right? So it's my highest weight. Now, now I start applying E minus on this. First time I apply E minus, I will just get H, a 2H. This will have, so this has, uh, this has H quantum number. So here I'm writing the H quantum number, H eigenvalues. This has plus one. Okay. This is eigenvalue zero, but the state is not zero, you see. State is H, actually. Then I apply again another E minus, I will get uh, E minus, and that's it. That's a, a joint representation. Three inde linearly independent objects. Huh? This is the zero eigenvalue, but th this is not zero. This is a. Hmm. So that, that's the way. Huh? Okay, so uh, that's that. Uh, so therefore, uh, I mean, so what means from this argument we are seeing that uh, every time I apply E plus, I'm going to get back one step, but arrive at the same state up to some number, right? So it's not that I'm going to produce some new states. It'll be the same state. So this actually provides a representation. And by construction, it's irreducible representation, right? Okay, there's no smaller space which is invariant number under the full Lie algebra. Because already we saw, saw that E minus are taking you to all of these places, right? So this is, and these are linearly independent states. So this gives you an irreducible representation. The dimensionality of this irreducible representation is k plus one. Okay? But now I want to ask, what is the is there a relation between J and K? Right? If I knew the relation between J and K, then I would know precisely the spread of this. I mean, what all, what all other all eigenvalues are there in this particular representation, right? So there are several ways of doing it, and I will let me uh, show it uh, one way. Actually, this way, this way, uh, uh, following this procedure. But another way is much simpler. I will do that a little uh, immediately after I finish this. This way of doing it. It is this is a direct way of doing it, right? So I know that the, the condition of this guy, this is what's called lowest weight state. Just like this was the highest weight state because E plus annihilated it. This is called the lowest weight state because E minus annihilates it. Lowering operator annihilates it. So uh, we are saying that this state is zero, right? Oh, okay, if it is zero, then let us just look at this guy. E minus to the K plus one, E plus actually one W, right? Well, since this is zero, so this better be zero, right? But then you start pushing this across, okay? So if, as you saw, every time I push across, I will get uh, some uh, something which will be so a vector which will be e, e minus to the k times some number, okay? Now e minus to the k on W is not zero, so that number better be equal to zero. That is an argument. 
Okay? This we know is zero. Okay, let's just uh, proceed. So now uh, let me do the same thing. I start pu pushing it one, one step at a time by using commutators. So the first step, you get uh, e plus e minus and e minus to the k, w. Uh, and then you get here e minus e plus e minus to the k, w. Now this is 2h. So 2h means 2 times j minus k. 2h okay? acting on that. H eigenvalues here, j minus k. Okay, okay. times e minus k, w. And the next time, again I do the same thing. I write this as a commutator. And then what will be left over is e minus square, e plus e minus to the k minus 1, w. But this guy will be, uh, what did I say? No, 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 something wrong here. Uh, this is not correct, right? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. What am I saying? Yeah, this is not correct. So here, this, this was originally it was e minus e plus e minus to the k. Now what I do, I try to push it once more. So I, I rewrite this as e minus to the k minus 1 and the commutator e plus e minus. So I take, take out 1 e minus and write that as a commutator. So this way, I step by step, I push it, start pushing e plus in. But this time, I'm going to get 2 times j minus k uh, minus 1, right? Because now there are only k minus 1 lowering operators here. So if eigenvalue of this guy, this is 2h, h eigenvalue is this one, j minus k minus 1. Okay? Uh, times again the same, e minus to the k w, e minus to the k w because there's e minus to the k minus 1, and now this is a number, so I can move this across this number and then you get e minus to the k and you keep going and it's clear that every time you you go one step further the h that will appear in the commutator will see lesser number of lowering operators so the j h eigenvalue will be going one by one step one 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 after you know, in one unit so at the end it's not hard to see that it's going to be a sum to j minus k uh, plus r, okay. uh, r going from 0 to k, 2, 2 is, I can take it out, times e minus to the k, yeah. right. so you see that uh, the, uh, the first, the zeroth step, r equal to 0, you got that number, r equal to 1, you get this number, and so on, you keep going. The last step will be when you have uh, just, I mean, the last step would be when you have just e plus and there's only one e minus left over here and here you have e minus to the uh, k minus 1, right? The last step. So now again I write it as a commutator. Then I'm going to get 2, uh, this acting on w. Then I'm going to get 2h acting on w, but that is simply uh, j, 2j. But that means r equal to k. Right? That is uh, 2j unit. Because after that, then an e plus will act directly on w, and w is the highest weight, e plus annihilates it. Okay? So this is all you get. And this has to be zero because my original thing was zero. Okay? So this is zero. This is an identity we have proved. Right? But how can this be zero? Because by assumption, this state is not zero. Because we are saying this state exists. Okay. is the next state which is 0. So the only way it can be 0 is if this sum gives you a 0. Okay. And that's what is going to give me a relation between k and j. So let's just compute that, that sum. So I want to, uh, so uh, what we have is this sum uh, must be equal to 0. R equal to 0 to k j minus k plus r. This sum better be equal to 0. Otherwise, we are in a contradiction. No? Uh, so, so let's just do this sum. So I, I, I can do it, split it into two parts. The first part is the sum r equal to 0 to k j minus k plus sum r r equal to 0 to k. 
Uh, this one does not depend on r, so I can take it out. So it's just a sum of 1 from r equal to 0 to k. How many terms are there? k plus 1 terms. So the first term just gives me j minus k times k plus 1. Here, r equal to 0 of course doesn't contribute. So you might as well write this thing as a from r equal to 1 to k. Okay? But that's some you know. This, is, this guy is nothing else but k times k plus 1 by 2. Okay. So this plus that should be equal to 0. That's what we are saying. So let's just put them together. So this plus that equal to 0. Now k plus 1 is a com common factor. So I take out k plus 1. Over 2 I can take it out. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then you get here 2j minus k. Now k plus 1 cannot be 0. Because remember, I have taken, I mean, I uh, how did I start? I started from the highest weight and I keep applying e minuses. So k is the number of times you are applying e minus. That must certainly be non non negative. Is it 0 another k? Huh? Because. Sorry? Another k because uh, this two uh, two j minus k and there is a k in the other in the second sum. Yeah, but that is what made it. So you get here two j minus two k, yeah. right? Plus k, right? Plus k from here. Oh. So that is what makes it minus k. Sorry. Yeah, I should have said that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I mean, so the first statement is that k. Is, is, is a non-negative integer. Non-negative integer, right? Because what was k? k was, I mean, I started from w and I started applying e minuses. One times, two times, three times, right? So k better is going to be some, k could be of course zero, meaning it could have been that this itself, I mean, when you apply e minus on it, this already gives you zero. It could have happened, right? I mean, this might have, itself have been both highest weight and the lowest weight. State. Okay. In which case, representation will be one-dimensional. There's a trivial representation because everything annihilates it. Okay. So, uh, so, so k is certainly a, a non-negative integer. It could be zero, one, two, whatever, but it cannot be minus one. Okay. But uh, so this cannot be zero. Right. I mean, we are saying that this whole thing is this is supposed to be equal to zero. There are two ways it could have been zero. One that this could be zero. This is a factorized expression, right? Either this would, could be zero or that could be zero, right? But what we are saying is this cannot be zero because k is a non-negative integer, right? So the only way it can be zero is this equal to zero. So that tells you that k is equal to two times g. Okay. So that gives you this. So this procedure gives you also the relation between the j and this, how many steps you go. After that, after which you arrive at the lowest weight state, how many steps you need to go from highest weight to arrive at the lowest weight? That's that's k, right? So it gives you that relation. But then let's look at uh, all the. Uh, let me write it down here. Let's uh, let's, let's write down all the eigenvalues. Now, first of all, there are several consequences of this. So one consequence of this is that since k is an integer. This, uh, and we, we are saying that this must be 0. So j can only be an integer or a half integer. If k is an even number, j would be an integer. If k is an odd number, j will be half integer. Right? So j must be necessarily, j is necessarily, let's say, say necessarily, how, how many s's are there? Two s's. <laughs> I'm not sure. Necessarily, uh, half integer, or integer. That's a remarkable fact, right? I mean, we didn't do anything. We just played with algebra, right? And we are saying that uh, these are quantized. I mean, it cannot be. Uh, the, the fact that H is Hermitian just tells you that J is some real number, right? That's all it tells you. But this algebra is saying that the only way you can get finite dimensional representations is if uh, H quantum numbers are, H eigens values are integer or half integer. There's no other way. So this is a, one very important conclusion. Um, uh, now, second, look at look at the spread of the h eigenvalue. 
So we started with W, which had eigenvalue, uh, eigenvalue J. So this has a, in this, so let me just write E minus uh, W, E minus square W, all the way up to E minus with a K W, right? Because after that, it is not, doesn't exist. Now let's write down the H eigenvalues. H eigenvalues. So here we started with J. That was our definition of J. Here I'll be, it'll be J minus 1 because it reduces by one step. J minus 2. And here finally I will get J minus K. Right? But we are saying J is equal to K by 2. I mean that relation, uh, so th that relation 2J minus K equal to 0 implies J equal to K by 2. So let's just pluck the explicit value of, uh, or, or maybe or maybe better to write like that. K is equal to 2j. So k is 2j. That means this is minus j. Right? So the eigenvalues are going in steps, j, j minus 1, j minus 2, all the way up to minus j. So this is completely symmetric. Right? So if you if you plot, if you plot, uh, yes, I mean you can see uh, well, it, well it's obvious from here but just to plot. Uh, because pictures are much easier to under, uh, remember. So if I plot uh, the eigen, eigenvalues, so here I'm plotting eigenvalues of h. So we start, we have a j, and then uh, in steps of 1, I keep, com keep coming down, j minus 2, etc. And then I arrive here at just the reflection of this thing, so minus j. Right? Actually, there's a reflection symmetry here. You just reflect. And these eigenvalues are uh, so far. If there is a, if j is suppose half integer, then zero will not be needed. Uh, suppose so. Let's take an example. Say j is three half. Okay. So you have three half. Then you have one half. You have a minus half and a minus three half. Okay. So it's a mirror reflection. This is a very important symmetry. Actually, it turns out that uh, this is a general generic feature that there are mirror symmetries, uh, mirror like I mean, reflection symmetries in the in the in the space in this eigenvalue space, roots. There's always some reflections. And the and more uh, complicated the algebra there are many because higher dimensional. This space will be higher dimensional. Root will be vector, no? living in subdimension. So uh, there will be lots of reflection symmetries. So the patterns are very beautiful patterns that you get. So this is the uh, uh, similarly, if it was an integer, if the j was integer, uh, you will pass from 0 also. So let's say j is equal to 2. So you have a 2, 1, 0, minus 1, and minus 2. Again, there is a reflection symmetry. I mean, these symmetries are, I go by the name called Weyl symmetries. Weyl was a great mathematician. So, minus these are like ref reflection symmetries. He also had a book on the symmetry and quantum mechanics. Oh yeah? I mean, okay, yeah. I mean, he was great, of course. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah. Uh, but there is a, okay, here it, it required some amount of work, right? I mean, to go through this, through this combinatorics, uh, you know, keeping track that you don't make a mistake. For example, if you had made a mistake, you know, particularly, you know, you, you see that it should be something like this, but you might mistake in the limits. You might say, well, r equal to zero certainly is there because that was my starting point, right? But where it ends, you might have said maybe k minus one. In that case, you will get totally wrong answer, right? The relation between j and k will be completely different. Okay? So, uh, so there are chances of making mistakes in this process. I mean, silly mistakes, you know, but uh, not conceptual mistakes, but some silly mistakes. Uh, but there is another way of doing it, which is much more straightforward. Well, actually, it boils down to the same thing, basically. But you can uh, see. Uh, and that is the following. Uh, since I know, I've al we already argued that this, this is a representation. This k plus 1 states provide a rep representation. Okay. So, by the way, did we assume that this is irreducible? Or uh, no, my construction is irreducible, right? Because I started from the one state W, mm -hmm. highest weight, and started applying E minus. Mm -hmm. E minus spanned all of these K, K plus one states, right? How do we know that? 
expand all of them. Mm. Because that was my definition. Right? The, the, st the step at which e minus k, this process stops. I, I don't count it. But this is a, a set of eigenvectors which are uh, satisfying this. But there might be another single eigenvector or here, uh, but that will, be, that will become reducible. So if you we want. assume irreducibility. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah exactly. We are saying irreducible. Yeah. Uh, and by construction, this is irreducible. Mm -hmm. So we are saying that what is the definition of K? Definition of K was the first time, I mean, you start increasing the K step by step, one, mm -hmm. one two, three. The first time that uh, this is not zero, but E minus to the K plus one at the number of zero. So this happens for the first time as we start increasing the k, progressively. 0, 1, 2, 0 is nothing, 0 is w, w state, original state, 1. I mean, it could have been that already first action of e minus annihilates it. In that case, k would be 0. Right? So it may be the second step. Right? So whatever the minimum value of k, lowest value of k, for which this happens. There is also another question for that. Uh, isn't it possible? Here, eigenvalue to be zero, not eigenvector. We might end up. Where, where, where? Sorry, where? Uh, where we define the maximum uh, number for k, uh -huh. uh, we uh, apply it and the result is zero, but it might be uh, because of uh, a zero eigenvalue, not zero state. No, zero, the, uh, the zero eigenvalue with respect to h. Yes, but we don't know what the uh, constant number. Uh, gets out of uh, after applying e minus. Yeah. So we are not sure if we uh, end up with a zero. No, but I mean, so whatever I, I mean, whatever the, the state is. Well, so the okay. Uh, I mean, whatever the state here you get. I mean, e minus the k plus one. If this is zero, and that's it. Okay. I mean, it's not a question of. I mean, I mean if this is zero, yeah. the equation is true. Yeah. Uh, we just say that uh, the state. Uh, now created is zero state, zero vector. But zero. are you sure that uh, it is right. zero? I mean, it's zero because vector. the constant in front of that vector might be zero, not the vector. But what does it mean? I mean the, uh, this is just a zero vector, then, right? I mean, I, I just I, I don't need to talk about it, right? Yeah, but uh, for so long as this, this whatever the remaining states are provide are providing your representation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, otherwise, I mean, for example, let's say I take H acting on. Uh, H acting on sigma 3. Let's say the same example which we were discussing. Sigma 3 is zero, right? A joint action. A joint action, a joint action of uh, H acting on, on sigma 3 is zero. But then I cannot just say that, so, but, but this is not enough right? because I need to also look at other guys. Add of E plus and E minus acting on sigma 3. That is not zero. Okay. Yes, but uh, we didn't prove that. That's right. Uh, prove what? Uh, prove what? Yeah, proving that it shouldn't be zero. In a joint representation, I cannot guess what the value is. Yes. Uh, but we can always start with uh, k v, which is positive to eigenvalue. Because if not, if it is negative, I can just take the negative of the this vector, and it has positive eigenvalue. And when you construct w, you are assured that the eigenvalue are you start from positive and as it's increasing, it's always positive. So when, uh, it, when we apply it one more time and it gives zero, the eigenvalue cannot be zero. So it must be. Yeah, zero. but those are the eigenvalues of H. But I mean, here is we apply E minus to a state, mm -hmm. then uh, the result is some number times some new state. But the zero times any state, any vector is a zero vector. Yes, but if the vector. Uh, is not zero and we want to multiply it zero. So what do I mean by vector? I mean, right hand side is, is, is called a vector, right? What are you this? The right hand side is zero vector. Zero vector is a unique vector. Yes. In the vector space, no. Yes. But we, uh, we just assume that it would be a zero vector. Uh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not saying. Shall I write something on the table? I don't know oh, if yeah, we have yeah, time, yeah. but uh, maybe uh, later we can discuss. No, all I, I mean, maybe I should. Uh, I'm saying that this state, I mean, this state is a zero vector. What is the problem with that? I mean, what is the contradiction with this? My question. Uh, this is just a, uh, a this is just a claim for me. That's why. No, I, I mean, what I'm saying, this has to happen. The finiteness or the, the dimension. This of the has to happen, but yeah. uh, because of what? Because of we are end up in, we end up with a zero vector, or because the number in front of the new vector is zero. 
What did you do vector? Uh, there is no zero times any vector is a zero vector. There's nothing more. I mean, zero times one is a zero, right? Yes. So this is a zero vector. Right? That, that's all one is saying. Right? We're not saying the new vector is zero, but that vector is zero. This vector is not zero. E minus zero. Okay. But the next guy is zero. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what one is saying. And now look at all this uh, states which we have already. Those are all non-zero, right? And ask the question: Does it provide a representation? And we have seen, show, we showed that it form, forms a re representation for the fully algebra, right? not just the e minus e plus and h, of course. And that's it. So the, uh, and also it's by construction is irreducible. So you have everything. All right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I was saying. I mean, uh, h acting on uh, sigma 3, for example, and h acting on sigma 3 is 0. But that's not enough. I mean, because it's, so the result of action of this is a 0 vector. I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. Uh, now, the question is, is it 0 or not? Yeah. I'm not concluding that. I'm not saying that uh, because e minus acting on this is 0, that this is 0. No, I'm saying that this is non 0, right? You see. Okay. Uh, so, so almost time. Let me see what I uh, have to say here. Ah, I wanted to give you a simpler uh, proof. A uh, simpler, simpler proof. Actually, at the end you'll again do yeah, this combinatorics, but it'll be a bit easier. You don't have to go through this pushing trick, pushing the J plus to the right or left. You know, this you don't have to go through that trick. So the idea is the following. Now, uh, in this representation, so we, we said that the states from uh, W. To uh, e minus to the k, but k is nothing else but 2j uh, w. This provides an, uh, a representation for the SU2 d algebra. For, for uh, let, let's be explicit, for a, h, uh, e plus, and e minus, uh, h, little h, e plus, and e minus. It provides a representation. So, uh, now let us take the following. Let's com compute the trace trace in this space. This is, k, this is a 2j plus 1 dimensional space, right? So there's a 2j. So, there's a two j, so th all these matrices are 2j plus 1 by 2j. A, the h and e plus minus in this representation are all 2j plus 1 by 2j plus 1 matrices, right? I mean, the, these are all matrices, right? Matrices are acting on some representation. If representation is 2j plus 1 dimensional space, representation space 2j plus 1 dimension, all these guys can be written as 2j plus 1 cross 2j plus 1 matrices. So these are all matrices. 2j plus 1 and 2j plus 1. This way, and rows and columns. All these matrices. So let us try to compute the trace of H in this, in this representation, in this 2j plus 1 dimensional representation. Well, can, can one say something about this trace? Uh, what should it be? I mean, a, a priori, without uh, zero. zero. Yeah. Why it should be zero? Because uh, the our the very important one relation was this e plus e minus commutator is two times h. Okay. So I can write trace of h as one half trace of the commutator e plus e minus trace of this. But trace of any commutator is zero, right? Because of cyclicity. What is this? This is nothing else but trace of e plus, e minus, minus, e minus, e plus. Okay. And uh, trace is cyclic, so you can move this across, but then this cancels with that, so you get a zero. Okay. So you know that uh, in, in, in any, uh, I mean, the, so trace of h has to be zero in any representation. Okay. So uh, that immediately, so now let's write down, let's choose a basis. I mean, of course, the explicit matrix will depend on what basis you choose, right? So let me just choose a basis. Say the first guy is W, second guy is uh, uh, E minus W, and so on. And the last one is E minus to the uh, K, K W, right? So H, of course, is, uh, these are all eigenstates of H. So 
the H matrix in this basis, if I choose this basis, it will be just numbers here, J, J minus 1, all the way up to J minus K. And the, the fact that trace is 0 means the sum of these guys must be equal to 0. That, that's all. Huh? And what is that sum? That sum is uh, simply, yeah, you can write it as J minus R, and uh, uh, so and we are summing from r equal to 0 up to r equal to k, right? So j r equal to 0 is the first one, r equal to 1 is the second one, and the last one is k, r j, j minus k. So that is a trace. So the trace, trace of this matrix is that, right? Uh, and that is the same thing. This will give me j times k plus 1, the first term, and that one is minus k times k plus 1 by 2 which is the same as k plus 1 by 2 times 2j minus k, the same object. So that's, that's, uh, that's a quick way of doing it. It's sort of pushing the e plus step by step, you no? Know? Uh, this is just in one stroke you get that. Um, yeah, this is a, this again, this trick we'll be using many, many times when you go to, when we go to higher Lee algebras. So all of these tricks that are going to be used extensively. This is why I, I keep repeating that. You need to understand SU2 complete, I mean, inside out. Because huh? these are the tricks we will keep repeating. Uh, but in writing that matrix, we just, did we assume that it is 2j plus 1 times 2j plus 1 or uh, 2k plus? Sorry, not 2j plus 2, yeah. uh, sorry, k, k, k plus 1 by k plus 1. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the relation. At the moment, I should still write k. Yeah, it should be k plus 1 by k plus 1. So it's um, k plus 1, correct. k plus 1 by k plus 1 matrix. To begin with, right? And then, then it's a conclusion from that. Uh, from, by tracelessness condition tells you that uh, uh, k must be equal to 2j. Yeah, I use that because we already obtained it the other way. No? But, uh, yeah. So any time uh, trace of an operator, which can be written as a commutator of two operators, that will be zero. Two matrices. Yeah, be zero. But of course, in order to do that, you need to make sure, go through the first steps. No, you need to show that this is a, a representation. That was crucial. I mean, if we had not shown that if, uh, this, of course, uh, closed under the E minus action. I mean, it, uh, you don't get any more state when you apply E minus, right? Also, H when you apply, you don't get any more states because it's an eigenstate of H. Each of them. Question was about E plus. When it could have happened that when you apply E plus, you don't go back to the previous state. You go to some linearly independent state. No. If there are, in that case, you cannot apply that because there will be more different multiplicities for each of them. No. But that so in order to have used this trick, you need to first prove that. This set, set of states that you are considering, that if they form a representation. Otherwise, you cannot use this. But if there is a degeneracy and you go to another state, wouldn't that uh, be manifested in the matrix form as blocks for if because yeah, degeneracy yeah, 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 would yeah, have a block? Exactly, exactly, exactly. So then there will be multiplicity. I mean, so, so some of the eigenvalues may come with some. Uh, several times, so it yeah. may come with the it will come with the degeneracy factor. No, that, uh, yeah. Okay. Any other thing to say? Ah, maybe just the last few minutes I can mention something on the Casimir. Huh? Yes, we do Casimir. But uh, any question here? This is very important to understand. Actually. So please feel feel free to. Ask. I don't care how much time we spend on this, but this is really crucial. Uh, how can we infer irreducibility for, from uh, those matrices? Uh, uh, repeat that again. Uh, how can we infer uh, in irreducibility when we see a uh, matrix like this? The, is there any connection between degeneracy and irreducibility? No, no. Uh, I mean, uh, no, uh, not directly, not, not direct connection. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I mean, in a irreducible representation, you'll have many, many states at a given J3 number, H quantum number, right? For example, I can take uh, 
a combination of uh, spin one and spin, spin, I, spin I mean J, J is a spin, J, J I call spin. Huh? Is more, uh, I think, better to call an isospin or something. Because spin is a space time, a Lorentz group action of spin. Okay. This is more the internal symmetry. But okay, we, we, people usually just call it spin. So the spin J representation. But I may take um, some reducible representation of spin 1 and spin uh, 2, for example. No? So spin 2 has plus 2, minus, plus 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2 h quantum numbers. Uh, spin 1 has plus 1, 0, minus 1. So you see plus 1 has appeared now when you combine the two. So you are taking 5 plus 3 dimensional space. Right? Then uh, spin 1, uh, plus 1 eigenvalue will appear twice. Uh, plus, 0 will appear twice. Minus 1 will appear twice. Plus 2 and minus 2 appears once. In this particular case. Right? So the degeneracy is not 1 in this case. Right? But this happens to be reducible representation. But if you, what, the, what this statement is saying is that if you Focus only on the irreducible, then the multiplicity is always one. Because this is, uh, in fact, yeah, this, this exactly, this is the irreducible. This representation is irreducible, and then that's where we find. So, so in this case, when the uh, subalgebra is only one dimensional, that means that it will be, re the representation is already irreducible. The one dimension, so repeat the same. The, the subalgebra, Cartan subalgebra is one dimension, that means the representation we choose as this one will be irreducible already. Yeah, I mean, with respect to subalgebra, yeah, yeah, with respect to subalgebra, it is reducible. Yeah. Each, uh, yeah, in that case, everything is one dimensional. If you just talk about the Cartan. Right. But if we kind of construct this kind of representation with a subalgebra which is two dimensional, it wouldn't be irreducible already. Yeah, unfortunately, there is no other subalgebra apart from there is no two-dimensional subalgebra here. Yeah, so SU2 is three-dimensional, right? Uh, so you have a Cartan subalgebra, but that is very trivial. I mean, abelian. Yeah? Uh, but then uh, there is no other subalgebra here. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I mean, if you uh, uh, if you say sigma three, you are taking right now. If you take any one of them, sigma one, let's say. A commutator of sigma 1 to sigma 3 will give you sigma 2. So that's that's the idea. Yeah. I mean, it, maybe I should mention also the point that you were raising before. Uh, or, okay, first we were testing it. Okay. Uh, no, the, the point was that in this process we have gone to sigma plus and sigma minus. Hmm? Those are not relation. SU2, we started with the Hermitian mat matrices, right? I mean, Lie algebra, well, Hermitian or purely anti Hermitian, depending on whether you put an I or not. So, but uh, this has mixed sigma plus or sigma minus is neither Hermitian nor anti. Actually, uh, the sigma plus dagger, if you look at sigma plus dagger, sigma, sigma plus or sigma one, sigma one plus I sigma, right? So if I take sigma plus dagger, I will get sigma one is Hermitian, sigma two is Hermitian, but it will change the sign of I. Mm -hmm. So this will go to uh, sigma, sigma plus was that, so this will go to sigma 1 minus i sigma 2, which is sigma minus. So sigma plus dagger is sigma minus. But that's okay, I mean, you see what we are, so, uh, so it looks like what we have done is we have by considering sigma plus and sigma minus, now we have, we have gone to a complexification of the algebra. Because right? before we were saying that the sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 were generators, and we are only allowed to multiply real numbers. Right? So it, it had a real dimension 3. Right? But now we are allowing to multiply by complex numbers. So apparently we have increased the dimension. Right? That's OK, right? because at this stage you are just trying to find the representations. Right? Representation is a complex Lie algebra. But then you can restrict to the real Lie algebra. Okay? And the restriction is very easy. All you, because of this fact, you say that any arbitrary element will be some x times sigma 3 plus, say, z times sigma plus, plus z bar times sigma minus, z bar being the complex conjugate. Hmm? So that again is reduces to, so you restrict yourself to that. Right? If you are talking about uh, SU2, you restrict to that. Uh, in which case, you just get back the SU2 algebra. So it is, so at this stage we found a representation. So we have the matrices for this, matrices for this, matrix for this, I mean this kind of matrix. 
we have. Huh? I mean, in principle, like, we have not constructed it. Okay, J3 is that. I mean, H is that. E plus, also we know how the E plus acts. We know that E plus is going to push you up, right? One step. So what will be the matrix which will push you up? One step. It will be not diagonal. It will be just the upper diagonal. Just one, one step here, right? Because E plus takes you only one step up. Or E minus takes you one step down. So if I want to write down an E plus, and uh, the E plus, this is the this is the H matrix. This is the H. Okay. Uh, e plus will be of the form. Uh, so you want to apply. So let's say something which acts here. I mean, this state should be taken up, right? Uh, so it will be like the uh, okay, diagonal should be zero. Okay. And here you get uh, something. Let's say some number, some non-zero number. Uh, similarly, non-zero number here, non-zero number here. And so on, but everything else. Right. These precise numbers will depend on the kind of the normalizations you choose for these states. Okay, so these are not universal numbers. I mean, it depends on what normalizations you choose. If you just call them these are vectors, then of course it will give you some definite numbers. Those numbers were just obtained by. Uh, yeah, okay. There, there's a way to get these numbers. I mean, by again playing with algebra. You can get this number. Uh, if I, E minus will be one step lower, it will be all diagonal, zero, and this will be non zero, E minus, because it's pushing you down, one step down, and everything has zero. So, this is the structure of these matrices, the explicit form of the matrices, in this basis. Of course, the, the precise form of the matrix will depend on the basis that you choose. No? You can choose any different basis. So the statement would be, after having found this, then I'm going to, as you truly algebra, I will recover by, I mean, this are, of course is a vector space, right? So any linear combination of this is again an element of the Lie algebra. So I can ask what is the, what is the matrix of that? But what we are saying is that I don't allow arbitrary linear combination. I allow only this, comp this restriction, real number and a complex number here, but this number should be complex conjugate. So I take those combinations, and those will give me SU2, SU2 matrices. Okay. SU2 in this representation, in this basis. Okay, uh, okay. let me just quickly, quickly, very quickly do the Casimir, because I actually will not be talking too much about the Casimir, uh, but just to, because this we have seen in the, in quantum mechanics and so on, I think, the Casimir operator. The Casimir operator, uh, is uh, something which commutes, which commutes with all the generators of the algebra. Genera commutes with commutes with all the generators of the algebra. Generators of the, of the algebra. So in the SU two case, it should commute with the uh, H. Uh, sigma plus and or sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, all of them should come right? And the, the claim is that if you take this object, uh, let's say now in any representation, let's say, so I take R, so these are matrices now, right? And it makes sense to multiply matrices. So R of sigma A times R of sigma A summed over A. So choose, pick some representation. Okay. and compute this quantity. Then the claim is that this, this commutes, this operator, which I let, what is the mix? I think we call C2 probably. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what we call <coughs> C2, yeah, C2. So this we call C2. Why C2? Because it's only quadratic. Okay. It's quadratic <laughs> in the generators, right? I mean, generators are at least in, the, in certain representations. So this is what's called C2. And uh, the, the claim is that this commutes with all of the R sigma A. So we want to we want to check that this is true. So so R of sigma A. So we want to compute. We want to check that C two commutes with all the generators in this representation, of course, R sigma A. 
for any a. Right? This, this should be equal to 0 for all a. For all a. We want to check that. I mean, if, if it is not true, then this will not be a casting net. So the question is this. So let's compute that. So you have your r, sigma, uh, this is a here. So let's call it b here, sigma b, r sigma b, commuted with r sigma a. The, this repeated indices is a sum over. So we want to compute that. But then you can just use a standard matrix uh, properties. And this will become, you can write it as sum of two commutators, right? So you will write here, you get here as r sigma b. Uh, times uh, r sigma a uh, uh, times r sigma b uh, plus plus other way uh, the plus other way plus the other term which will be plus r sigma b and commuted to r sigma b r sigma a. I mean, what I, I mean, just open it up and explicitly and easy to see. So this is R sigma B, R sigma B, R sigma A minus R sigma A by definition, R sigma B. R sigma B. That's a computer. Okay. Now what I do is I add and subtract this piece. So write this as a commutator. Okay. But then I remove the extra piece which I needed. So that will become plus r sigma b, uh, but now it's other way, r sigma a, r sigma b. Okay. And then, uh, and these two combine. So this gives you already one term, I think, which was uh, this one. Right? And if you combine this with that, then you see r sigma b on the, on the left, on the right, that's a common. And here you just get the commutator. So it's this one. Yeah. So you're just adding and subtracting to make them to come with it. Like the operations that we were doing all this time, when you're pushing E plus or E minus. Okay, so, so what is this? This is, uh, this commutator is nothing else but epsilon B A C, I mean 2i, epsilon B A C. Well, the commutator, since it preserves the Lie algebra, it is R of the commutator of sigma B and sigma A, right? But the commutator of sigma b and sigma a is b a c, sigma c. So that will be r sigma c. And uh, here, uh, then you have r sigma b. Right? So th this is still multiplying the r sigma b there. And here, what you get? The other term, the second term, uh, it will be r sigma b sitting on the left. So we have r sigma b. And then this commutator is the same. So again, you get 2i epsilon b a c r sigma c. You can combine these two things, and then you find uh, it is the same term, except the ordering has changed. Right? So this is the same as 2i epsilon a b c r sigma c sigma b plus r sigma b sigma c. Okay. That's what you get. But this is 0. Because this is anti-symmetric in b and c. Epsilon abc is anti-symmetric. Whereas this is symmetric in b and c. So this must be 0, right? Uh, I mean, very explicit you see that. Since B and C are dummy indices, I can relabel these guys, right? Keep the labeling here same. Here, call this C and that B, so that you come get to same order, right? When you do that, so so there is an epsilon, so put the epsilon ABC inside, and here also epsilon ABC. But now, just rename this. I have to sum over B and C, so just call this B as C, and C as B. So this became C, and that became B. But then I have to change also here. This will become epsilon A, B, A, C, B. Okay. Now this matrix is the same as that. But here you get epsilon A, B, C plus epsilon A, C, B. But that's zero. Okay. So this quantity is zero. So this proves that uh, uh, the C2 
C2 commutes, the C2 defines that way, uh, commutes with all the sigma R sigma. C2 uh, commutes with all, with for all A. For all A. Because I didn't specify any specific, any particular A, that calculation is for generic. Any, A could be any, right? Okay. So, uh, so what, what does that mean? Uh, since it commutes with all of them, uh, on a, on a, in a given irreducible representation, C2 is just a number, right? Because irreducible representation, by definition, I could start from one state and get every other state by just applying the Lie algebra elements, right? So if C2 has some value for one state, then it will have the same value for the, all the states in the, represent, in the irreducible representation. Okay? So, on an irreducible, so C2 is basically proportional to identity matrix. Hmm? There will be some number times identity matrix. Because it's, it's a, every state is just comes back to itself, right? I mean, so so that, that is what it is. So therefore, uh, so, so C2 in each representation, in each irreducible representation, Is is proportion is proportional to identity. I mean, for not just C two, uh, any any operator, or not just this particular kind of operator, because here we check explicitly. But if suppose somebody had come up with some other operator, no, which is satisfying this condition, then that would mean that this operator will be proportional to identity on the in, in a given irreducible representation. Proportion, so it, it will be some number times identity, right? That number may depend on which irreducible representation you are talking about. Different irreducible representation may have different. Those numbers may be different, but it will be all proportional to identity. Okay. Now, how can I compute this number? This number, uh, for many physics reasons, these numbers are quite important. They, this uh, that proportionality constant. Hmm? So to compute this number, you can. Maybe I should stop here, right? You're getting because it's just another two minutes. Should I continue? Okay. Uh, so to compute this number, you can uh, uh, do the following. Let's write it in terms of the, our. We wrote it in terms of sigma a. We can write it in terms of equally well uh, h and sigma plus and sigma e plus and e minus, right? So I can write it as uh, so. Well, um, h square was sigma three square by 4. Okay, there's a 1 4th one, but that's an overall 1 4th definition. And here I take sigma plus times sigma minus, uh, which is again divided by 4. But sigma plus times sigma minus was uh, plus sigma minus sigma plus. Okay. Uh, and maybe I have to normalize it with the 1 maybe. I'm not sure. Let's see. Uh, so this, this guy uh, by definition was half sigma 1 plus i sigma 2 and times half sigma 1 minus i sigma 2, and similarly the other one with the opposite ordering. So this, when I open it up, I will get here half sigma 1, 1 fourth sigma 1 square, plus 1 fourth sigma 2 square. And then you will get cross terms, which will be half, so plus half, uh, plus 1 fourth, sorry, 1 fourth uh, i, so sigma 2 sigma 1 minus sigma 1 sigma 2. Now this term will again give you the same, except that a sign will flip here. Right? So when you add these two things, this will cancel. Right? I mean, you clear, right? I mean, you flip the sign here. This becomes minus, and that becomes plus. So when you take the cross term, I will get an overall minus sign here. Okay? So when you add these two things, this will cross, cancel, and this will just add up. So you get here half sigma one square. So let me make it half here. So make everything half. Uh, so, so this is uh, so this is proportional to that C two, right? Okay. Uh, now, uh, so that's what. So therefore, what we are seeing. So in a given representation, this was what we were calling e minus e. Uh, sorry, h square. So one half h square, uh, uh, one half h square, plus this was e plus e minus plus e minus e plus. Okay. The point is. That I mean, you can, as we said, uh, since it commutes with the, all the Lie algebra elements, 
in a given irreducible representation, it's the same number, no matter on what state you calculate it, right? So you might as well choose a state to be the highest weight or a lowest weight, you know? It will have the same number, whatever the number you get. So if I choose to act on the highest weight, so let's suppose I apply it on the highest weight to find what that number is. Hmm? Well, this is already going to annihilate it. This one is not annihilating yet, but I can again do this trick of writing it as a commutator plus E minus E plus. This term, this time I write like that. But this again, this will annihilate it. And this object is 2H, right? 2H. Maybe I'm missing the factor of 2 either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because H is defined. Ah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, correct, correct. Uh, H was, H was uh, in fact, sigma 3 by 2. I mean, little h was sigma 3 by 2. So h square, so it should be 2 here. 2 h square. That's, that's correct. So here you get 2 h. And the, all this annihilates the highest weight, this annihilates the highest weight. So we are left with simply 2 times h times h plus 1. I mean, 2 h squared plus 2 h. So h eigenvalue was j on the w. So this is simply proportional to j times j plus 1. That's it. So the Casimir, C, uh, the Casimir for a given representation is j times j plus 1. Proportional to, I mean, this overall number is whatever the way you define the C2, overall number. That will not change with which representation you're talking about. The representation dependence comes only from this. So C2 is going to be J times This is what you were calling, I think in the quantum mechanics you were calling it total angular momentum squared, right? <coughs> we were, I think there you were calling it L, L plus 1. In quantum mechanics, L was always integer, right? That was because we were talking about SO3, not SU2. But in the discussion of general angular momentum, we were discussing, how, for example, this Ben J would be half and C2. You were also? Yeah. The operator, S squared would be 3 over 2. Uh, multiplied by the identity matrix, which is uh, compatible with this, because if J is half, it would be three half. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, three half, yeah. No, but I'm just thinking in the in, when you did quantum mechanics in the undergraduate level, you were only talking about the integer spins, right? Integer angular momentum. Were you talking about half integer also? We, 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 in fact, we, for example, we were taking the Casimir operator S squared and the for, and the sigma three, uh -huh. and we were coming that the common eigenvalues, and we were saying because that's a common eigenvalues, we can uh, um, we can uh, make the diagonalize the S squared with uh, S S Z, uh -huh. and we that so S squared would be of the form uh, uh, something. A, 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 a matrix with, the, with only the diagonal elements non-zero, and from that we use the, the algebra of S plus and Z minus to know uh, other, other SX and S1. Yeah. No, that, that's fine, but what I'm saying that in physics, the, the reason why you get, uh, you do this is because uh, you have some rotational symmetry, right? Some, some problems are rotational symmetry. Then you're talking about naturally SO3 represented, in the uh, uh, SO3. Uh, so SO3, Remember that in uh, SU2, two elements are mapped to SU, uh, one element. So what, in fact, yeah, I, I will discuss that tomorrow. tomorrow. No, it's getting late. Just to, yeah, I will try to dis distinguish between half integer spins and, and integer spins. You remember, if you discuss about the center, I mean, there's two elements, G and minus G, or one identity and minus identity of the SU2, which is mapped to the same element, identity of SO3. Right? So, uh, we will see that uh, the minus identity will act as plus one on integer spins and will act as minus one on half integer spins. Okay, that's, what I, that's something I'll discuss tomorrow. That will take a little bit more time. So I'll, stop so I'll continue tomorrow.